I'm very happy to introduce our Grand Round speaker for today. And our speaker, Dr. Gabrielle Winston McPherson, um, is the Associate Director of Chemistry um, at Henry Ford Health in Detroit. Um, Dr. Winston McPherson um, got her bachelor's degree in biochemistry and molecular biophysics from the University of Arizona, and then her PhD from our neighbor state um, in pharmaceutical sciences at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. And then she went on to do a clinical chemistry fellowship at the University of Washington um, before moving here, uh, moving to Detroit to join Henry Ford. Um, so she's during her journey to clinical chemistry, she's recording uh, in progress. She has been um, active in a number of societies, including um, um, ACLIPS and the uh, AA, uh, American Association of Clinical Chemistry, where she serves as chair of the uh, Michigan section of that organization. And she's on the annual meeting organizing committee for the AACC. She has a number of publications, particularly in recent years, looking at laboratory issues around transgender health, which is an extremely interesting field. And we on the Diversity and Inclusion Committee of the department were really anxious this year to focus in our grand rounds um, on um, findings um, related to pathology and transgender health. So she was an obvious choice for us to have as our speaker um, this morning. And so she is going to talk to us today about transgender health and considerations in clinical pathology. And I think we're all looking forward to this talk. So thank you so much, Dr. Winston McPherson for joining us this morning. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Powell, for that fantastic introduction. I feel so, so welcome and um, just honored to be invited to speak with you all today. So thank you again for the invitation. Oh. Make sure. Okay, I think I have to click here. Oh. Here we go. I had a, a little delay with my, my slide advancement, so hopefully no more challenges. Um, I want to start off with my disclosures, so nothing of a financial nature to disclose. I'm excited for the day where I have something to uh, put in that field. Um, but importantly, I have a personal disclosure, and that is I do not myself identify as a member of the transgender community, right? I, I identify as cisgender. And so um, I, I come to you as a laboratorian. Um, that's very much where my expertise lie. But throughout this talk, um, I'm going to be explaining some um, concepts that are related to being transgender. And my perspective on that is inherent inherently limited because I'm not a part of that community. Um, so I, I just want to encourage folks that if you are curious, if there's information that you want to know about the experience of being a transgender person or a gender diverse person, it's very important to listen to the voices of those people because they're gonna give you um, the, the, the most beautiful information. Um, and my acknowledgments. Um, I like to start with these right up front so that they're not kind of rushed at the end. Um, I think they're so important because um, I, I really couldn't be here speaking today if not for these people, um, particularly Dr. Dina Green, who was my mentor when I was a fellow at University of Washington and continues to be one of my mentors today. Um, and, and I really credit her for pulling me into this work and, and sparking my interest in the first place. And in general, I think in the field of laboratory medicine, she's really at the forefront of, of doing this work and, and um, conducting studies that help laboratory medicine improve transgender health. Um, also on this slide, I have um, 
different clinical colleagues, um, Zill Goldstein, um, Giolani Dai, um, Mo Connolly, these are clinicians that work to care for transgender people. And so as I interact with them, I'm constantly learning more about the needs of this population. So um, huge thanks to, to everyone on this slide. So our learning objectives for today. Um, first and foremost, I, I hope by the, the end of this talk, you will come away with an appreciation that sex and gender are not the same. Um, I also want you to be able to recognize the existence of gender diversity in, in all its forms. Um, sometimes we, we kind of collapse gender diversity down to male and female. I'm sorry, I should say man or woman. And, and it, that's not exactly the case. So we're gonna dig into that a little bit. Um, I want you to be familiar with the types of gender affirming care and then be able to identify how particularly gender affirming hormonal therapy can impact laboratory values in a clinically significant way. Um, so starting off with sex and gender. Um, as I said before, one of the objectives here is to understand that they are not the same, even though sometimes the language around sex and gender is used interchangeably. So I want to be clear, and, and when we're talking about sex, what I mean are physical characteristics of male and femaleness. Um, this can be hormonal expression, this can be secondary sex characteristics or chromosomal attributes like X and Y chromosomes, um, specific sex organs, right? So, so um, things specific to anatomy at times. And what's important about sex is that we see that it's fairly consistent across time and cultures, right? So, so sex in 18th century France versus sex now in the United States in 2023 largely is pretty much the same. Um, also consistent across different species of our class. Gender is different. Gender is more social, behavioral, personal. Um, it's the way that we express ourselves. It's the way that we interact with each other. Um, it's how we dress. It might be our understanding of different jobs that folks can have in this society, right? So what's considered a more masculine job versus what's considered a more feminine job. And then in contrast to sex, um, gender is not consistent across time or cultures. And one of my favorite examples of this um, is uh, Louis the Fourteenth, right? So this would be considered the height of masculinity in 18th century France, a man in heels and tights. Um, and today, this is not what we would consider to be the height of masculinity. So it's just an example of how it changes. Um, so I really like this infographic because it helps us to break down some really important concepts. So I'm going to start off with gender identity. So what does that mean? Um, gender identity is essentially who you are on the inside. It's who you know yourself to be with regards to your gender. So when you close your eyes and you're by yourself, it's your understanding um, that, that you identify as man or woman or, or something beyond that binary, right? It's very personal. Gender expression is how you show that gender to the world, essentially. So it's, it's how you dress, it's how you do your hair, it's how you communicate to those around you what your gender is. Sex assigned at birth is, um, you know, I think it's a, a very descriptive term, right? It's when you're born um, and based on physical characteristics, how you are, um, what your sex is determined to be. So categories here, male, female, but we also know that there's diversity here, right? There are intersex people as well. Um, who you're physically attracted to and who you're emotionally attracted to. Um, these can be different for many different people. So one of the reasons why I like this figure is because when we think about it this way, it helps us to kind of break these different components apart. So oftentimes in our society, what we do is we collapse all of these things together. And what that means is 
when sex is assigned at birth, for example, female, then that defines your gender identity. And that defines your gender expression. And that defines who you're attracted to. Um, and for a lot of people, these things do line up and that collapsing isn't problematic. But for other people, these things do not line up, right? So that sex assigned at birth doesn't define your gender expression, doesn't define your gender identity. And these things can, can form in a human being in any combination of ways. So I think that when we live in a culture that um, holds true to certain concepts or ideas, such as a gender binary, it can be hard for us to unlearn some of those things. And so I find in my life that I'm that I'm often having these aha moments, right? Where I, where I think I kind of get something, but then I have a moment where I really get it. So I wanna share what was for me, um, what I consider to be an aha moment. So what I'm showing you on this screen is a picture of my own um, 20 week sonogram. I should, I don't know if I should say it's mine or my child's. <laughs> it's not a picture of me. Um, and at that time, um, you know, this was the anatomy scan. So um, we were able to identify the likely sex of this kiddo. And my partner and I, we really didn't want to know. Um, but we, we were kind of unsure if maybe we would want to know in the future. So they took this little picture and they put it in this envelope. And this is the cover of the envelope. And when they handed that envelope to me, I really kind of took a step back and, and was very surprised because what I realized in that moment is so much of how the world will view this kiddo has now already been defined. And if I open that envelope, and I see what it says, if I see boy or girl, and then share that with the world, now that determines, you know, what, what kind of clothes people are going to send me for a gift. It's going to determine how folks think about who my kiddo is going to become. And so, so much pressure um, about how people are allowed to be and exist in this world is determined so early in these moments before a person really has had an opportunity to develop their own gender identity, their own sense of self. Um, studies show us that this forms by the time kids are around four years old. So before this person was able to tell me who they are, society is really deciding for them. And it's kind of a funny thing that we do if, if you think about it that way. So um, an aha moment for me, and, and I just wanted to share it with you all. So now some important voc vocabulary. Um, I think in talks like this, typically you will see these slides. Um, and I think it's important to be really clear with the language that we use because many of these terms are going to come up throughout the talk. So um, actually, I, I just wanted a logistical thing. Should I be trying to monitor the chat? Um, I see that there's been a couple of things pop up. No, um, I can do that, that okay. uh, from Amy, but I'll monitor it for you. So don't okay. worry about it. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Um, okay, so so first term is transgender. Um, this is an adjective used to describe people whose gender identity differs from the sex that they were assigned at birth. Um, and so we can have um, uh, a transgender man, for example, is someone who was assigned female at birth, but who is a man. A transgender woman, vice versa, uh, someone assigned male at birth, but who is a woman. And, and sometimes we use that modifier, you know, transgender man, transgender woman, or trans man, trans woman, but it's also okay to just call these people men and women. Um, and sometimes that's, that's really what they prefer, you know, without using that modifier. Cisgender is an individual whose sex assigned at birth aligns with their gender identity. Um, 
And then some, some other terms, non-binary is one. And these are people who experience a gender identity or expression that kind of falls outside of that binary of man or woman. So, so their identity is somewhere else on that spectrum. And another term that's, I think, becoming utilized a lot more is the gender expansive community. And I really like this because I think it allows us to be very inclusive. Um, it, it's always interesting to talk about vocab around gender diversity, because on the one hand, while we're saying, you know, let's let's get rid of our binary understanding of, of gender, but then, OK, let's categorize transgender people into these different categories. So there's, there's a tension there. So that's why I really like um, using this term gender expansive community, because I think it still gives you space to be inclusive of all of that diversity and not try and, and really put people into buckets. And then the final term on this slide is gender dysphoria. Um, and so the, the definition here is, is pretty boilerplate. You'll find this in a lot of places. Um, the language is, is really similar um, depending on what, what definition you pull. Um, but this one is clinically significant distress caused when a person's sex assigned at birth does not align with their gender identity. So I, I struggle with the, this definition of gender dysphoria for a couple of different reasons. Um, the first one is that I think what a lot of gender diverse people are telling us is that the way that this definition is phrased, it makes it seem like gender dysphoria is because your sex assigned at birth doesn't align with your gender, ident gender identity. But that's not really the case. The dysphoria is because everyone around you is not recognizing or acknowledging your gender identity, right? It's not something that just exists because you're trans. It exists because as you move from throughout the world, people misgender you or they they won't call you by your name or or they they won't allow you to just express your gender in in the way that it truly is. And that's what the dis the source of the dysphoria. So it's not inward out, right? It's outward in. It's it's society's pressure on these people. The other thing about gender dysphoria is some trans folks don't experience dysphoria. Um, some experience more, some experience less. So it's it's not um, a, a given for transgender people, and I think that's important to acknowledge. So what kind of health disparities do we see amongst the gender diverse community? Um, more and more studies are coming out of late that describe some of these things. Um, in the past, it's been hard to kind of wrap our arms around disparities in this community because we weren't capturing um, gender diverse people on different surveys, but, but now we do a lot better at that. And so what we know is that as compared to cisgender counterparts, um, gender diverse folks are more likely to live in poverty, have an unmet care need, have a chronic condition such as cardiovascular disease, report depression, have attempted suicide or have suicidal ideation, experience abuse or harassment by healthcare providers. This is one that that always makes me cringe when I when I see this over and over. And I want to say the statistic from from this study was was something like. 35% of, of transgender folks in that survey communicated being abused or harassed by a healthcare provider. Um, also less likely to have health insurance, have seen a healthcare provider in the last year, have access to a PCP, or have a provider that feels competent to treat them. So many of these things are related, right? So if we talk about having negative experiences when you seek health care, well, that's related to then avoiding health care, right? Um, um, you have a negative experience and now um, you have to be really, really sick to go and seek treatment from a health care provider. And then that contributes or exacerbates health disparities. So a lot of these things really are related. Um, I also want to touch on this point here. 
um, have a provider that feels competent to treat them. Um, in my discussions with clinicians who um, serve gender diverse communities, they often state that they have to tell their patients what to tell doctors when they go to the ED because they're just not, it's getting better, but not getting the training or haven't had the training in the past to be competent to treat these people. And then that also impacts um, the laboratory in different ways that we'll talk about later. So this talk really is focused on the intersection of laboratory medicine and trans health. And so in order to get into that, we have to think about what kind of health care needs does this community have? And largely, it's the same healthcare needs that, that anybody has, right? It's, I have an infection, um, I broke a bone, um, I have, you know, this weird growth on my finger, what's going on here? So, so the same needs that we all have. But there is a special need that some members of the, the gender expansive community need, and that is gender affirming care. And it, it can look a lot of uh, look different in different people. Um, so I have some examples listed on this slide. So gender affirming care for a trans woman, there are social types of gender affirming care, right? So that might be how you dress, that might be a name change, that might be communicating what your pronouns are. Um, and then there's also hormonal therapy, so gender affirming hormonal therapy. And for a transgender woman, that would likely or that would um, mostly entails estradiol and, and sometimes antiandrogens are prescribed for trans men. Largely, it's, it's testosterone as the hormonal therapy. And then there's also surgical interventions. Um, and some of those examples are, are listed here. So again, just emphasizing that not all trans people need or desire to have surgical types of gender affirming care or even hormonal types of gender affirming care. Um, there, there's a lot of diversity amongst the types of gender affirming care that is needed. Um, but what I also want to emphasize is that everything listed on this slide is considered standard of care. There's nothing here that's considered um, rogue or, or experimental. All of this is considered to be standard of care if needed. And many of the treatments here are very effective at addressing gender dysphoria. Um, so, so this is, is really important treatment. So my summary of this section um, just the, the quick takeaway points from that introduction are gender and sex are not the same. There is rich diversity beyond the gender binary that exists that needs to be recognized. Um, transgender folks do experience significant health disparities and um, gender affirming care, standard of care that involves social, hormonal and surgical interventions. Now we're going to get into our considerations for chemistry and hematology. So kind of picking back up on gender affirming hormonal therapy. Um, so just a reminder um, for feminizing therapy, the main types that we're talking, the main thing that we're talking about here is estradiol um, with or without antiandrogens. And the, the purpose of the antiandrogens really is to suppress testosterone. Masculine, masculinizing therapy is testosterone on its own. Um, you don't really see antiandrogens here. Testosterone um, is typically enough to suppress estrogen. It's very, very powerful. Um, so the key questions, I think from a lab perspective that come up when we're talking about gender affirming hormonal therapy, um, on the one hand, for patients who are getting this therapy, how is it going to be monitored in the laboratory, right? So, so which labs are commonly ordered? And then the other question is how are labs then influenced by gender affirming hormonal therapy? And so we're gonna kind of tackle those two questions in the next few slides. So that first key question, right? Folks prescribe gender affirming hormonal therapy. Um, how are they going to be monitored in the laboratory? Um, in 2017, endo, or the Endocrine Society treatment guidelines or the updated guidelines were released. Um, and this is a really important document because it provides um, great information on 
dosing of different feminizing therapies, um, the intervals that patients should be monitored, how they should be monitored, different labs to look out for, different risks associated with the therapies. It's a really important document. And um, I'm just picking out a couple of pieces that I think are key to the lab. And the first one is for folks on feminizing therapy. The guidance document states that these patients should be monitored every three months for the first year after starting their therapy and then biannually. And so what this says to me is trans folks are going to be coming to your lab, right? So um, once they start this therapy, um, every three months, they, they should um, present for a visit with their care provider and likely need to get labs drawn. The goals here are testosterone less than 50 and estradiol um, 1 to 200. And then if the patient is prescribed um, spironolactone um, as an antiandrogen, then electrolytes should be monitored to um, keep on top of any risk for hyperkalemia. For masculinizing therapy, what the guidelines state um, are very similar in terms of the interval um, that these patients should be monitored. Testosterone targets listed in the document are 400 to 700 nanograms per deciliter or, you know, the age matched cisgender male range for whatever lab um, um, is providing that information. Should also monitor hemoglobin hematocrit and, and lipids. So I want to kind of go back to these values listed for testosterone and estradiol, right? Where did these come from? So if you read through the document, um, when it's listing that recommendation, I want to say it's it's two papers that they cite um, for the support of these values. And, and they're pretty clear in the guidance document that they recommend the target values be in line with that of the affirmed gender. So basically what that means is um, if you're getting masculinizing therapy, you should have testosterone consistent with a cis male. And if you're getting feminizing therapy, you should have estradiol concentrations consistent with a um, cis woman. But from, from my perspective, I will say, I think the evidence for that recommendation from a lab perspective is a little bit thin. Um, and, and mostly it is um, clinical judgment. Okay, so, so the second key, key question, right? How are lab values impacted? So now we've really kind of opened up the floodgates and instead of just thinking about, you know, the, the small set of labs that are monitored to track this therapy, now how are any other labs um, that are going to be ordered for this patient population going to be impacted by gender affirming hormonal therapy. So I'm starting off with this really, really nice study um, that came out of UT Southwestern um, by Dr. Jeff Sorrell. So this was a multi-center retrospective analysis, and you can see the cohort details here. This study took place between 2007 and 2019, looking at data from three transgender specific clinics in the Dallas area. Um, so they, they monitored patients um, retrospectively for up to five years, looking at, you know, before they started their hormonal therapy, so the baseline values, and then um, monitoring labs for that time frame after starting their therapy. They looked at metabolic profiles, CBCs, lipids, and, and endocrine values. And really the goal here was to understand, are these labs going to shift? How are they going to shift? And how long does it take them to shift? And I think those are really three very important questions that helps us as laboratorians understand what to expect for patients that are prescribed this therapy. So what did they observe? Um, for sex specific values, so, so for example, um, um, hemoglobin, hematocrit, right? We have sex specific intervals for those. The lab values shift towards the affirmed gender. So again, to be explicit about what this means, this is your hemoglobin hematocrit, if you are a trans man prescribed testosterone, is going to shift towards the range expected for cisgender men. 
Um, RBCs, creatinine, they saw stabilized after about six months after starting therapy. And then other markers took a little bit longer to stabilize. So, right, so in this data, you see a period where the values kind of um, um, aren't consistent, maybe they're going up and down a little bit, and then they stabilize. So for lipids and platelets, that took up to a year. And then the other thing that they saw here is that there were some statistically significant changes, right? So statistically, um, the change from baseline was meaningful, but not clinically significant. So I think we all kind of understand, you know, what statistically significant means based on the type of test that they were doing, but what does clinically significant mean? So from my perspective, this really means, could the change in the lab value cause misinterpretation, right? And if that change could cause misinterpretation, then that really is clinically significant. And that's information that providers need to, need to know. And, and when I say that interpretation change, really what we're talking about here is reference intervals. That's gonna be the next thing that we talk about. Um, I'm really gonna skip this slide altogether. I, I don't think that I need to talk about the importance of reference intervals with this audience, but um, suffice to say, it's really one of the main ways that the lab contextualizes test results and, and they're very important. So the question becomes, right, we, we, we saw that data indicating that lab values can shift for folks prescribed gender affirming hormonal therapy. So if you have an adult that's prescribed this therapy, you know their lab values are gonna shift, what reference interval applies to that patient population, right? How do we contextualize and interpret those results? So this really was the focus of uh, a large pilot project um, spearheaded by um, the folks on this slide and many others um, focused on deriving reference intervals for healthy transgender men and women on gender affirming hormonal therapy. So this was a prospective analysis, right? Um, individuals were recruited for this study. There was robust exclusion criteria, um, a requirement that patients were stable on their therapy for a year so that they weren't being um, evaluated while they were um, in that still kind of dynamic um, period. And the types of testing that was evaluated was chemistries, hematology, cardiac, and reproductive endocrine. And um, when I first started putting this talk together, I had intended to kind of go through each of these, but we would be here all day. Um, so I'm just going to kind of cherry pick a couple of studies that I think have a, a, a really important clinical impact and, and just hit the highlights for you. So starting off with hematology. So I, I, I open up this slide with this question. For which analytes does the reference interval of the affirmed gender fit? And the first group of analytes that really um, give you a strong yes to that question are our hematology um, parameters. So just to kind of explain what I'm showing in this figure, um, we have hemoglobin, hematocrit, red cell count. Um, the three boxes at the top are data representative of our testosterone cohort. So this is, um, these are transgender men prescribed testosterone. And the boxes on the bottom are representative of the estrogen cohort. So transgender women prescribed estrogen therapy. The dotted line or the hashed line on each of these boxes represents the reference range for the cisgender counterpart. So to be clear, the, the hash lines here would represent the cis male reference interval and the distribution that you see here, the actual values um, I determined in our patient population. And I, I love this figure because the data could not be more perfect, right? Um, it, it very clearly shows that transgender men prescribed testosterone fit the cisgender male reference interval for hemoglobin, hematocrit, and red cell count. And the same can be said of our estrogen cohort. They just, the data fits so nicely within those reference intervals. So here's a point of clinical impact, right? If 
providers are not aware of this. Um, if the reference interval that is applied to a patient who is being monitored using these parameters um, is if it's not clear that they're a transgender person, um, if the reference interval that's applied is just based on whatever sex assignment is, is in the laboratory information system, then you're at risk of having a misdiagnosis of anemia um, for trans women or a missed identification of anemia, anemia in trans men. And, and really here, what I wanna point out is, this is something that my clinical colleagues have told me. They've said, when we send our trans patients to the ED or to their, their primary care provider, we tell them that they have to explain to their care provider what range should be used for, for CDCs. They're the ones who are responsible for that information. And, and just imagining, you know, having to visit the ED for whatever circumstance and now being responsible to explain to whatever provider is seeing me what values are expected um, is, is something that I wanted to point out. So this, this I think, has um, a large clinical impact. Okay, continuing with this question, um, but transitioning to some sex hormone data, particularly estradiol and testosterone, um, again, for which analytes does the reference interval of the affirmed gender fit? So here we have to think about trans men and trans women separately from each other. So this is data for transgender men in this cohort. Um, the solid line at the bottom of the figure represents the reference interval for um, cisgender counterparts. So in this example, cisgender men, this is the reference interval for estradiol. Um, and what we see for estradiol is that the range for trans men is wider than it is for um, cisgender men. And, and I think this kind of makes sense, right? Um, so, so really what it says, particularly at the upper end, is that estradiol in transgender men is just not going to be suppressed down to the same level as it is in transgender men. And then for total testosterone, the reference intervals overlap each other actually quite nicely. And, and we saw something similar for free testosterone as well. So this is a situation um, where testosterone for transgender men really fits the, the reference interval for cisgender men, um, I think, quite well. And, and I want to remind us here what the goals were from those endocrine guidelines. Um, so they don't explicitly state what the goal for estradiol should be in the endocrine guidelines, but I'm just using here what is expected for um, cisgender men because they do state that, um, less than 45 picograms per mil. And the testosterone value that they state is 400 to 700 or in line with the cisgender male reference interval. Um, and so I think you kind of have to be careful about that, right? So the overlap between the cisgender male reference interval is very nice, but if you have providers that strictly adhere to the 400 to 700, you, you, you might get into a little bit of trouble because we do see more variability in terms of the reference interval um, in this cohort. So for cisgender women, um, the reference intervals, I'm sorry, for transgender women, the reference intervals that we have for estradiol and total testosterone um, do not fit very well at all. So just to kind of orient you to this figure, um, the dotted line again is the reference interval derived for transgender women prescribed estrogen. And then the dotted lines are the cycle specific intervals for cisgender women. And overall, the amount of estrogen that we see within that population is a lot wider um, and higher it can be than the estrogen um, reference intervals for cisgender women. And then the same is true of testosterone. So we, we I, I will be fair and say we did not 
I'm not showing the data parsed out for individuals who were prescribed spironolactone, um, but even in that cohort, we still see um, higher values of testosterone in our transgender women than is expected in cisgender women. So this really is a case where the cisgender reference intervals just do not fit. Um, and then and another reminder of, of what the goals were as listed in those endocrine guidelines, and you can kind of see how they relate to the information that we see here. Um, 100 to 200 um, really seems not appropriate for the, the population that we monitored or that, that um, this data came from, and testosterone less than 50 is a really tight target um, to expect to achieve in transgender women. So, you know, that's just some highlights of the data, but on mass, what came out of this study has allowed us to kind of think about the question in this way. And so I have to give credit to, to Dr. Dina Green for starting to put this framework together in terms of an approach to answering this key question. So I'll just state that question again. Which reference interval applies to transgender adults taking gender affirming hormonal therapy? So this seems like a good way to approach that question, right? So you start by asking, is the reference interval for the analyte um, that you're evaluating sex specific? And if the answer is no, likely the reference interval is not going to be impacted by gender affirming hormonal therapy. And, and you're fine to use the reference interval that's been verified in your population. However, if the answer is yes, what we're seeing is that there's two possibilities here. Either the reference interval um, aligns very well with the affirmed gender, um, and that's the most appropriate one to use, or really a unique reference interval is needed. And then that's what we saw in some of the endocrine values for transgender women. So in summary for this section, um, gender affirming, affirming hormonal therapy is monitored using clinical labs, right? So, so you expect to see lots of labs visits for this population. Some sex specific analytes do shift towards the affirmed gender such that they fit the reference interval of the affirmed gender. Um, however, for people prescribed feminizing therapy, so estradiol, um, it looks like we need a unique reference interval for things like testosterone and, and estradiol as well. So I have some considerations for microbiology, and this is actually some of my, my favorite data that came out of the, the studies that I've been talking about today. Um, I want to keep us on time, so I'll try and get through this um, clearly but quickly. Um, so, so mainly what we're talking about here in terms of considerations for microbiology is the vaginal microbiome. Um, one of many locations in the body that we understand hosts a stable bacterial community, um, but the communities do change over time, um, influenced by things like sexual development and activity, hormonal changes, pregnancy, or, or different hygiene practices. But I also want to point out that um, the influence that the vaginal microbiome has on our overall health is really important. Um, so studies from cisgender women um, have allowed us to understand that the vaginal um, environment is optimally functioning when the microbiome is majority lactobacillus. Um, so very, very low um, within um, uh, environmental diversity and a low pH less than about 4.6. And when you do have more diversity in the vaginal environment, that's associated with some um, really unpleasant um, things like preterm birth, um, bacterial vaginosis, and susceptibility to sexually um, transmitted infections such as HIV. So it's important to keep a healthy um, vaginal microbiome. Now, again, I think I said it before, but our understanding of, of this system is entirely based on studies conducted in cisgender women. So, so what about transgender women, right? Um, what do we know about the vaginal microbiomes of transgender women? Um, answer to that question is very, very little. 
Um, so there really has been over time just a lack of resource, I'm sorry, research on um, transgender vaginal microbiomes, both um, uh, of transgender men and transgender women. <clears throat> and so what we tried to evaluate in this study is, is just to start to characterize what microflora is present in this environment. Um, so a little bit about the study design um, that, that led to the data, data that I'll discuss on the next few slides. Um, so 28 self-identifying transgender men were present in the study and 15 transgender women. Um, I do have to make a note that there was one non-binary person, but they were um, prescribed estrogen, gender-affirming hormonal therapy, and had been for greater than a year. We also had eight um, cisgender controls or comparators, and I'm going to talk about that um, a little bit later um, when cisgender women can serve as a control and when really they're just kind of a comparator. All participants were at least 18 years of age. Um, two vaginal swabs were um, self-collected vaginal swabs came from each participant. And most importantly, all of these participants endorsed being asymptomatic at the time of collection. Um, they also conducted a demographic and health questionnaire so we could get information like birth control, other hormones that they might have been taking, um, their sexual practices, um, et cetera. And then the but microbiome was characterized using um, um, uh, non-culture based methods. So we use next gen sequencing. And, and really, I just want to emphasize, you know, I know the cohort is small. This is really a pilot study because in the literature, there was almost nothing describing this environment in trans men and trans women. So starting off with what we observed in transgender men. So um, this is a figure describing the Shannon Diversity Index in both cohorts. And so that index is a um, description of alpha diversity. So within subject diversity, um, lower values indicate less diversity, higher values indicate more diversity. Um, so for trans men, I think it's pretty clear, um, a lot more diversity in that environment. But when we put this figure together, I think it really stands out that we have this bimodal distribution where some of our transgender men have higher diversity and some have alpha diversity that seems to be consistent with our cisgender women. So we're really interested to find out what's going on here. Is there some relationship um, between these participants? So when we looked at this a little bit deeper, we saw that, I don't think I said, of the six participants that had relatively lower alpha diversity, half of them were using a vaginal estrogen ring. Um, we also had one participant that was using estrogen cream, which can be prescribed for vaginal dryness, um, but, but they did not have lower alpha diversity. So what this suggests to us is that possibly there's some relationship between use of a vaginal estrogen ring and reduced alpha diversity. So it's one thing to say, okay, diversity is less, but it's quite another to then say, what's going on with that reduced diversity, right? So, so what's actually at the heart of that? And we answer that question by looking at the microbial composition in each of these samples. So I fully recognize, you know, this is a challenging figure to absorb when you have the paper right in front of you. Um, so I don't expect that having it up on the screen that, that all of the details are going to be apparent, but I, I will direct you to um, some of the key findings. So at first, when you look at this figure, really what I want you to appreciate is that there is a big difference between this side of the screen and this side of the screen, right? So we see lots of different species identified over here. Um, I should have told you before, I apologize. The x-axis are each of the participants in the study and the y-axis are all of the different species identified in their specimen. So this is that increased alpha diversity that we were talking about, right? Lots of different species identified in those specimens. 
Now on this side of the screen where you see much less diversity, most of what's identified here are different lactobacillus species. So all of our cisgender controls had greater than 90% um, relative abundance lactobacillus. And that's very consistent with what we would expect to see um, in a healthy vaginal microbiome of a cisgender women, woman. But there were also transgender participants over here too. And guess what? Those same transgender participants that had lower alpha diversity. So what we're putting together is that the vaginal estrogen ring leads to reduced alpha diversity, but it also um, is because those environments are majority lactobacillus, right? So that's the source of that reduced um, diversity. Um, and then just, just a note on this, there was a similar finding conducted in a study of um, Rwandan women who had at baseline of the study, I think 47% of them had diverse environments consistent with bacterial vaginosis. And then upon use of a Nuva ring um, that, that um, doses estrogen, um, diversity decreased and they had more lactobacillus present in their vaginal microbiome. So, so a similar finding in this study. And I think the clinical relevance here is that if a, a provider wants to support a healthy vaginal microbiome in a transgender man, um, a, a, a vaginal estrogen ring might be a good option. Certainly we need more data to support that, but I think it's, it's, it's an important clinical finding. Um, so this is data that actually was recently published on vaginal microbiome of transgender women, right? So, so to be clear, these are transgender women who have undergone vaginoplasty. I think it's no surprise um, that this is an environment that has not been well studied. And there's a lot of questions that are unanswered. Um, one question is, how do we define neovaginal dysbiosis, right? It, we don't have a good baseline for what a healthy neovaginal um, microbiome looks like. So we don't have a way to characterize a disease state in that environment quite easily from the vaginal flora. Um, another question, where does the vaginal flora come from? Um, what is the relationship between the neovaginal flora and surgical outcomes or things like infection, pain, or discharge? Is there a connection? Um, and, and, I think most of the data about this environment um, really has focused on um, surgical procedures, um, but less so about the vaginal flora that exists after that procedure has been um, completed. So there was a systematic review that came out, and I did want to point out that there were only 13 studies in that systematic review that had any information about vaginal flora in um, a neovaginal microbiome at all, which is surprising considering that, that this procedure has existed for 70 years. So in 70 years, we haven't fully characterized this environment. Um, I also want to mention here um, this, this concept of comparators versus controls. So in the previous study, we used cisgender women as our controls. And I think that, that that is fair, right? Because both of those are natal vaginas, so to speak. But for transgender women um, who have a neo-vagina, it's really just not quite the same as a natal vagina. Um, the way that it's formed is distinct from a natal vagina. Um, there's different ways that it can be formed. Um, one method, the most popular is from penile skin, but there's also a sigmoid colon method and a peritoneal flap method. And there is some data suggesting that vaginal flora is dependent on the type of surgery conducted used to um, form that organ. It's not subject to the same hormonal regulation and um, the relationship between specific flora and health and disease is unclear, which is, is not the case for the natal vagina. So here, when I show you the cisgender women participants as compared to the transgender participants, um, I'm not trying to say that that's a baseline for what a neo vagina should look like, um, but it, it, it's just a way of contextualizing that data. 
So in terms of alpha diversity, um, we see something very similar to what we saw for um, transgender men. So higher alpha diversity in transgender women and non-binary individuals. And again, this is consistent with, with those limited studies that have been reported previously. And then here's where we have our characterization of the different microflora. So, so really similar story, right? On one side of the screen, you see lots of diversity. And on the other side of the screen, you see almost none. So here we have all of our cisgender controls and we're seeing lactobacillus in all of those, I, I'm sorry, all of our comparators and it's lactobacillus. And we saw almost no lactobacillus in our, um, transgender or non-binary cohort. Um, so really only three participants had lactobacillus at all, and it was less than 3% relative abundance. And so what that says is, okay, maybe lactobacillus can be present, but, but no indication that it is or can be dominant in this environment without a little bit of support possibly. Um, we had very few transgender or non-binary participants that had a dominant bacterial species at all. Um, only three participants had any um, microflora present in greater than 50% relative abundance. And we tried to, to make connections between those participants in terms of their flora or, or their history. And, and really nothing stood out to, to indicate a possible connection between them. One thing that we did see that that has been consistent in other reports is that there are species commensal to gut and skin present in the vaginal microflora, which might suggest um, or, or might indicate what type of procedure a patient had. And then a possible relationship between sexual history and microflora. So there were a couple of participants that... Um, listed in their demographic survey, certain sexual history that seemed to line up with um, microflora that was identified um, in their specimen. And that's also something that has been um, proposed in the literature. So in summary here, um, vaginal microbiome of transgender men um, looks like it, it differs from that of cisgender women in terms of increased diversity and lower prevalence of lactobacillus, but there may be things that we can do to support a, a lactobacillus um, heavy environment. Um, and then the neovaginal microbiome is also a very diverse environment. However, it's unclear how that might relate to health or disease. But just trying to wrap up here because I want to make sure that there's time for questions. Um, um, certain things that we we didn't discuss today. There are huge informatics challenges that are important in terms of improving transgender care in the clinical lab. You know, some of the the reference interval data I was presenting before. You know, it's it's one thing to say, okay, we we determine what the reference interval is, but if we don't have a easy way to um, give that reference interval with a result for a transgender cohort, then then that's a big limitation. Um, there's also some pre analytical challenges, particularly those associated with um, interactions that trans folks have with um, lab staff. Things that are coming down the pipe to um, keep in mind, there is a CAP AECC guidance document for incorporating gender diversity into lab medicine. Um, and I think that's slated to come out in 2024. Um, and then also there's a current study, a multi-site study that's being worked on that, that I'm involved in, focused on developing gender cultural competency and humility training for phlebotomy staff that can really improve some of the interactions that they have with this population. Um, I think I will skip the take home points. Um, we've hit all of them throughout the talk and um, thank you all for your attention and, and I welcome any questions. Thank you so much. That was a fascinating talk. I really enjoyed that. And there was a question in the chat um, early on from Dr. Cross, and he wanted to know about what percentage of the population is in the gender expansive community. Is there any, do you have any uh, data on that? Or? Right. I, I want to say it's, um, 
I, I forget the percentage, but in the US, the low estimation is about 1.4 million. And again, that's a low estimation. And that's because, um, you know, as, as our culture becomes more accepting, people are more open in terms of their um, uh, comfort in, in saying that I am gender diverse. Um, so when you start to break it apart based on age groups, you see much more folks identifying as gender diverse in um, younger age groups. Yeah, okay. Do um, people have other questions? Just speak up. <laughs> I was, um, so yes, we have um, a question in the chat about um, any studies on how long levels um, of testosterone in transgender women could fall um, to within levels of cis women. So, um how long uh, so there there are examples where um levels of testosterone in transgender women do get low um and and are um around the range of cisgender women but when you look at the whole of the population there are um quite a few that that just don't suppress that low so it so it is possible um but then what you also have to keep in mind too is the relationship between that testosterone value and how gender affirmed someone might feel um is not perfectly correlated so it's not to say you know you need a testosterone of this value in order to achieve your gender affirmation goals. Um, so because there's not a connection there, um, I guess I'm, I'm just not sure if it needs to, to always be in the range of a um, cisgender woman. Yeah, that, that's a really interesting point also, you know, to consider the individual patient rather than the mean. Absolutely. Of yes. Yeah. And when, when we talk to providers, they make that so clear, right? It's, it's yeah. such an, an individual process of achieving effective gender affirmation. Yeah. And that's why I loved the very beginning of your talk when you talked about listening to the voices of the transgender community, which is really so important. And we shouldn't forget that. That's why the, the study that you're involved with, with um, re-educating our phlebotomy colleagues um, to be more inclusive is so important. And I had no idea personally about even thinking about the vaginal microbiome. And that's so interesting and yet so crucially important. Absolutely. So, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. <laughs> well, thank you so much. We have reached our time, but we really appreciate this. This was a, an excellent talk and um, we really appreciate your sharing this with us and we look forward for more to come. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you all so much for your attention. You've been a fantastic audience. Thanks for the questions. And um, um, if, if you have any more, um, feel free to, to email me or, or reach out. I love talking about this topic. Thank, Thank you all. You.